The lectionary texts for this Sunday and last Sunday both deal with the theme of recognition. Last week, it was two disciples recognizing the Lord over a meal when they had arrived at the village of Emmaus with their previously unrecognized fellow traveler. And this week, we hear about the Good Shepherd and the fact that his own sheep hear his voice. He calls them each by name. They recognize his voice and will attend to no other. What does it mean for a Christian to recognize Christ today? I'd like to explore that by first talking about what recognition might mean in terms of art, because the two phenomena are not that different. As a matter of fact, artists succeed or fail by virtue of what we might call recognition, and are therefore drawn to depictions of recognition scenes. Now, I don't mean the recognition that comes from art critics or society proclaiming the artist to be a great and original talent, but recognition in the sense that someone sees their work and does a recognition, a second mental take on what they are seeing. Will the viewer actually get what the artist is expressing? Will he or she rethink, recombine all that is stored in their visual and psychic and spiritual memory and arrive at the point where certain pieces fall into place and the viewer experiences that aha moment when the penny drops and the viewer gets it. Every artist wants to bring that about. And perhaps that is why so many great artists over the centuries have been drawn to the scene described in Luke 24, when two disciples are making their way back from the terrible crucifixion they have witnessed at Jerusalem, discussing the death of all their hopes. The scene depicted here is a stained glass window by the Tiffany Studios, executed around 1912. It is not the recognition scene itself, but the journey that precedes it. As the Gospel of Luke describes it, the two disciples are joined by an unknown, unrecognized stranger who accompanies them in their journey and questions them about the conversation in which they're so intensely engaged. They can't believe this person doesn't know about everything that has transpired in Jerusalem over the last couple of days. Has he not heard about the brutal death of Jesus? the miracle worker whom so many had thought was the long-awaited Messiah who would free them from Roman oppression. The stranger then begins to put their conversation into a larger context, suggesting that scripture actually foretells that the Messiah must suffer and die, just like the suffering servant in Isaiah. Don't they remember all those scriptures talking about the people being healed by the very stripes, the scourging that would be inflicted on this servant? Their hearts are burning as he expounds the scripture. They hang on his every word and invite him to join them for a meal when they arrive at their village, Emmaus. Initially, he demurs, but then he joins them and indeed sits down to share a humble meal with the companions he met on the road. He picks up the loaf of bread, gives thanks, and breaks it. And suddenly, recognition happens. Their eyes are opened. They put it all together. Yes, his explanation of scripture had been incredible, but it was the way he picked up the bread, the way he raised it to the Father and gave thanks for it that gesture of blessing and thanksgiving was the unique hallmark of their very own Lord and Savior and suffering servant, Jesus. This moment of recognition has been depicted by countless artists, but I'd like to focus our attention on the scene as depicted by Caravaggio in 1601-1602, when he was at the very height of his powers and one of the most sought after artists in Rome, the art capital of the world at that time. This painting was commissioned by a very wealthy private individual and would not hang on the wall of a church. 
Now this is a very large painting, almost six and a half by five and a half feet. In other words, it is life size. And that is one of the devices Caravaggio uses to bring about a sense of recognition on our part. The characters, so skillfully rendered, are the same size we are. The brushwork is also invisible. Caravaggio has thinned his paint with oil to such an extent that you cannot detect the imprint of a brush. This is photorealism before photography even existed. And we're sitting very close to the scene. We're seeing it at very close range, as if we were just on the other side of the table. Indeed, a place has been left for us right there. The disciple on our left pushes back his chair in astonishment, and his elbow almost appears to pop through the picture plane, right out of the canvas and into our space. The tear in his sleeve might as well be a tear in the surface of the canvas itself. Meanwhile, the disciple on our right reaches both arms out in amazement, and his left hand, again, appears to touch the canvas itself, pulling us right in with him. If you're wondering, incidentally, why he's wearing a scallop shell on his shirt or vest, it's because this shell has been a symbol of pilgrimage since ancient times the Christian pilgrimage, and it was popularized by those who walked the Camino de Santiago de Compostela and returned from their journey with a scallop shell from the region, showing that they had actually made it all the way. So it is an anachronism. The bowl of fruit, which is in fact a gorgeous still life, is pushed out towards us and seems so precariously balanced that we're tempted to move forward to push it back onto the table so it won't fall. All of these touches bring us close to the action. They include us in the unfolding drama. The composition of the three key figures also draws us in. The base of a pyramid is formed by the two disciples, and the space recedes toward the apex of that pyramid, the head of Jesus, brilliantly illuminated by the light that is so characteristic of Caravaggio, his dramatic use of chiaroscuro, literally bright darkness, the sharp contrast of a dazzling cinematographic light against the dark, shadowy background. The innkeeper on the upper left, unaware of what is going on, not recognizing anything, is outside of the triangle, his hands tucked in his belt, his face in darkness. And although the disciple on the left is pushing his chair away, all of his body movement is thrusting forward. The disciple on the right gestures towards us, but he too is leaning in. We cannot help but be drawn in as they are by these masterful artistic devices. And when we start to draw in, pulled forward, by all of these strategies, we find ourselves drawn to Jesus' face, beardless in this case, which is a rarity in art, as are his somewhat rounded features and cheeks. Usually Jesus is depicted with a thinner face. And we're also drawn, finally, to his wonderful hands. One hovers in exquisitely rendered partial shadow over the bread that is being blessed and the other is suspended in midair, beckoning both towards his father as he thanks him for the food, but also beckoning us to come forward and join him. It is this humble gesture of thanks and blessing that makes the scales fall from the disciples' eyes. And it's this same gesture that beckons to us, asks us, the viewers, if we will take part in the drama, be a witness and participant in seeing Jesus for who he really is. Personally, I find it very hard to resist the appeal of that extended hand. Contrast the recognition seen by Caravaggio with that of Titian some 65 or 70 years earlier. There's really 
nothing to draw us into this scene. The brilliant white tablecloth almost acts as a barrier, and the little fight going on between the dog and cat under the table diverts our eyes from what the rest of the scene is about. We can see where Caravaggio got the idea for having the innkeeper tuck his hands into his belt, uninterested in what is going on. But there, the similarity ends. Our eyes are drawn to the landscape behind Jesus. The mountains and clouds are as luminous as Jesus' face, and the improbable classical column behind Jesus' head is compositionally interesting, but it just adds another distracting element to an already busy picture. My eyes also drawn to the figure of the servant boy on the left with his perky little feathered cap and elegant costume. Now this is a beautifully crafted work of art, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't invite the viewer to participate in the moment of recognition that the disciples are having. We're placed at a safe distance to observe and admire, but not enter into the drama. That took a Caravaggio. Now, the same elements that go into the recognition of the resurrected Jesus in this picture also correspond to the elements that help us recognize the, present of, the presence of Jesus in our midst during a time of prayer and meditation. Our spirit needs to grow still and calm, which will take some time, just as it takes time to settle down and discover a painting. Our spirit needs to be quiet, but we also need to be alert and fully present. As the disciples knew so well, Jesus' most characteristic gesture was one of humble blessing, thanksgiving, and beckoning. It helps, I think, as we wait on Christ in meditation to have the spirit that he cultivated, one of thankfulness to God, of gratitude for the simplest things in life, the bread, the fruit of the land, the wine, the water, the presence of friends. Jesus was always thankful and a generous host. He made certain that everyone had more than enough to eat and drink. So as you wait in expectation and gratitude, I think you can fully expect him to beckon you as he does here. The Lord is gentle, he is kind, and he is generous with his love. He wants to be with you. You probably think I've forgotten about this week's lectionary text, which speaks of another kind of recognition. And maybe you wish I had forgotten, but I haven't. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, tells us that he is the good shepherd and that the sheep of his flock recognize his voice above all others and attend only to it against the clamor of the voices of all the false shepherds of this world. Now, to be honest, I couldn't find a work of art that addresses that text precisely, but another work came to mind. It's not too far off base, and I'd like to share it with you. It was the unlikely star of a blockbuster exhibition in London's National Gallery, an exhibition mounted in the year 2000 to recognize 2,000 years of Christianity, which was actually a pretty bold move on the part of the gallery and on the part of Neil McGregor, the curator at that time, since in many parts of England, churches stand empty, ostensibly a sign that England is a post-Christian country and wouldn't be interested in recognizing 2,000 years of Christianity. But the exhibition gave the lie to that assumption. The exhibition was called Seeing Salvation, it was the most viewed of any exhibition that year in England, breaking all records. 
And this is a picture of the catalog for the exhibition entitled The Image of Christ. The crucifixion scene on the cover is by Salvador Dali, but this and other monumental works of art, similar to it, was not the star of the exhibition. I know because I was there in 2000 and watched the huge crowds gather in front of this small painting. It's by a Spanish painter named Francisco de Zurbaran and dates from about 1640. Clearly, the artist borrowed his dramatic lighting technique from Caravaggio. But unlike Caravaggio's painting, which was nearly life-size, six and a half by five and a half feet, this picture measures only about 15 inches by 12 and a half inches. But it was this small, apparently simple painting that brought the people toward it in droves. And when they saw it, they fell completely silent. It has that effect on everybody. Now, this is not a still life. Often animals and birds find their way into a still life, but they're always dead creatures, part of the display of food being prepared. This little lamb is alive. Its eyes are open as it lies submissively, its small hoofs bound together, clearly waiting for the slaughter. Nobody needs to be told by an inscription that this was the Lamb of God. The Lamb didn't need to wear a halo or carry a Christian banner. You recognize almost immediately that this Lamb is Jesus, the Lamb who was slain. And even if you didn't know who Jesus is, the image of this gentle, innocent, helpless creature bound for slaughter instantly arouses feelings of compassion and indignation. This meek little creature should not be put to death. As with Caravaggio, the subject of the painting is very close to the picture plane so that we can feel the creature is right in front of us. The hooves, so pathetically bound together, are thrust out into our space. The fact that this is such a small panel and the color scheme so stark draws the viewer from a long way off to see what it is. The realism is very striking. Again, this is like photorealism before photography. Here, the recognition that we are in the presence of a figure of Christ comes quickly and with a shock. And in our gut, we feel the wrongness, the injustice, the utter pathos of this scene. It's been my experience that people react more strongly to the pathos of this scene than they do to monumental images of Christ crucified, or even to scenes of a pieta, where Mary holds the dead body of her son in her arms. Zerberan found a way to bring about a recognition by means of a surprise, a shock, and we see Christ in a startling new way. Both pictures, that of Caravaggio and that of Zerberan, lead us in a truly masterful way to a new appreciation of Jesus, a recognition of who he is that we may not have experienced before. And in that, they have achieved the supreme goal of great art. In the end, we get it.